We're thrilled to be here to present a timely web webinar entitled Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Military, a historical review of seminal cases and disparate treatment of, min min of minority service members, excuse me. It's sponsored by the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Armed Forces Law and the American Bar Association Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. This panel is the first of a two-part series on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the military. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists throughout the through the question and Q&A section of the Zoom um, webinar uh, program, not the chat function, that there's a Q&A section. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We'll address your questions at the end of the program. We will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And with that, we're thrilled to bring you today's program entitled Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in the Military, a Historical Review of Seminal Cases and Disparate Treatment of Minority Service Members. In just a moment, I will introduce our panel members, but why are we here today? We are hoping to provide an educational review and historical perspective of discrimination as it impacts on a deficit of diversity, equity, and inclusion practices in our military services. In my new position, I'm gonna share my screen. Sorry about that. In my new position as, problems here. <laughs> in my new position as the General Counsel for the Vietnam Veterans of America, I've been struck by the fact that our military and veterans have been dealing with this issue for years. Today, as our country is poised to make meaningful changes that will impact generations of people into the future, I am struck by the founding statement of the Vietnam Veterans of America. Never again will a generation of veterans abandon another. That's why we're here today again is to make sure that we have a conversation about the topics that are impacting our military. I don't know if my guest is on board, Alex Giese. Let me see Alex, because I wanted to present an introduction relative to a Vietnam veteran who uh, experienced some racism um, back in the Vietnam era. I don't know, does anybody see Alex? Okay. Well, I will continue and come back to that story. He is here, he's in the chat. He is there, okay. Alex, I'm gonna introduce Alex. Alex, if you can show your face. Alex and I met a couple of weeks ago. Um, Alex is not a former military member, but he has a passion for veterans and their, the benefits that we uh, deserve. Alex was introduced to the veterans, um, to the veterans law program uh, as a law student. He developed a passion for veterans and making sure that they are uh, compensated. And he joined a civilian firm where he was exclusively representing veterans and their families to help them receive the representation and benefits that they earned from their service. In April of 2017, Eric, Alec joined the VVA's Veterans Benefit Program. He's been a VSO. He became the chief of the VSOs, and now he is our, our trainer uh, teaching our new advocates about uh, veterans programs. Alex, I would love for you to share the story we talked about relative to the Vietnam vet um, a couple of days ago. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, 
How about now? You go. Hey, there we go. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Um, so thank you so much for having me. And the, the story are, of course, told through the veterans that I represented uh, while I was at the private law firm. I had the opportunity to represent uh, many veterans from Puerto Rico, the Vietnam era. And while all of them shared stories of being treated differently because of their Hispanic heritage, uh, one thing in common that they had is the language barrier. And uh, one thing that happened during that time period is that they were uh, recruited by people on the island of Puerto Rico that spoke Spanish. And uh, they were either, you know, the, the, the topic was either not broached um, or they were assured that they would be taught English in no time and they'd be able to integrate into the armed forces. Um, but unfortunately, most of them, they were given very cursory, you know, uh, two weeks or, 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 or less training and never actually learned English. And one particular client um, was not capable of understanding orders. And so during combat situations, um, people were shouting and yelling and he had no idea what was going on. And that actually induced PTSD uh, by the fact that he couldn't participate in the unit. He didn't know what to do in moments of high stress. And that's just one example of how uh, the, the Hispanic culture and the language difference wasn't really taken into account when uh, these individuals were, were brought into the service. Yeah, there was only they were really only given a cursory language introduction and then were supposed to speak English from that point forward. Absolutely. That, that is what was reported to me. Um, I also did have uh, several individuals that the reason for discharge was uh, reportedly failure to um, learn English. That was the reason for discharge. Most of them, they were, uh, they were honorable or uh, just general discharges, so it didn't bar them from benefits. Um, but I, I did have um, several clients that were very disappointed with this result because they came from military families and were committed to serving their country and felt that because they weren't adequately provided the resources to integrate into the armed forces, their, their careers were cut short. So uh, it was, you know, no matter how you look at it, it was not an, uh, it was a bad result for these individuals and, and frankly for the service. Thank you so much, Alex. Again, this is beyond just um, looking at the current policies, but what is the impact of those policies? What are we doing and how are we making sure that no one is uh, impacted by the policies that our military services present, bring? Um, this webinar is our time to dialogue about the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Here we strive to learn from each other. Do we have the same foundation when we talk about this? This is not about finger pointing or blaming anyone. It is our opportunity for a concerted effort to do what former Secretary of Defense Mark Esper called promoting an environment where, where we implement rules that further diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is about considering the ramifications of our, our actions and counting the cost to everyone who may be impacted by what we say and what we do. It is about changing our natural tendencies towards bias to one of inclusivity and equity. So now, as I begin to introduce our panel, I want to pre present the uh, DOD's policy policy statement on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It says, we are committed to making the DOD a workplace of choice that is characterized by diversity, equity, and inclusion. We remain steadfast in our commitment to promote an environment free from barriers that may prevent personnel from realizing their potential and rising to the highest levels of responsibility within the Department of Defense. Skipping down some, not giving the entire quote, we believe diversity is the key to innovation. Inclusion is imperative for cohesive teamwork and equality is critical to total force readiness. Let me briefly introduce our panel members. First up, we have uh, Professor Joshua Kastenberg. He is an associate professor of law and Lee and Leon Karalitz Professor in Evidence and Procedure at the University of New Mexico School of Law. 
We also have Lieutenant Colonel retired Carrie Ritchie, who is a retired Army JAG officer now serving as an Associate General Counsel in marketing, regulatory, and food safety programs with the United States Department of Agriculture. And then we have Active Duty Commander Sarah D. Groot uh, is the Executive Officer for Regional Legal Service Office, Naval District of Washington. Welcome, welcome panel. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to start with our first question. And as I give the question, please feel free to introduce yourself and give the audience a little bit about who you are. So my first question, our main purpose of this CLE is to educate. Does everyone have the same understanding regarding the current concerns related to diversity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to the military? Why are you passionate about this topic and what can you share to our audience about the past, present, and or future of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion? And we're going to start with Professor Kastenberg. Well, well thank you very much. And it's an honor to, um, to be here. And um, in, in regard to, to the, the very broad question, it's, I, I can only speak for myself, but I suspect this is true from any panelist or anyone who is willing to engage in an open and honest discussion on their thoughts, is that we care a great deal about democracy. We care a great deal about the women and men who are in uniform, not only today, but, but tomorrow. And in a sense, because as my students often joke in my evaluations. I'm a historian trapped in a lawyer's body, but I'm also a veteran of 24 years of active duty service in, in the military and um, a veteran who uh, has had to you know, reckon with some of his own biases. If you, had, for example, had approached me as an ROTC cadet back in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was president, I would tell you that um, gays couldn't serve openly in the military and because society told me that. And I came to realize that um, that bias that I was told I, I needed to have, like so many other biases, should be thrown on the trash heap of, of falsity. And, and so what I mean by that is, is in caring about it, uh, my approach, what I hope to do today is, is to have a reckoning with some of the important cases in history which might tell us why we think the way we think collectively or, or individually about the fairness of military law. I, I will say this, um, most of the people that I worked with in the military, most of the military law practitioners and the system itself is designed more or less to be fair, but it's a human system and it has human failings and it has human biases in it and it wasn't always fair. And so sometimes when we don't reckon with the past, um, we, 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 we skirt over areas that, that cement unfairness um, in it. And I'll give, you a, you know, I'll give you a very quick example of something that I just discovered the other day. I was asked by the Loudoun County, Virginia Historical Society to look at some court martial records from the War of 1812 that they recently uncovered. You, you could pay a bounty and not have to serve in the militia and go and fight the British in the War of 1812. Or you didn't have to pay a bounty if you could prove that your slaves, if you were a white slave owner, would take over your property. Now think about what that might have done to the socioeconomic standings of poor whites and, and slaves um, in, in the South. And that's just one area that hasn't really been, been uncovered. And that, that's ancient, I'm going to speak when my time is up to speak about much more modern cases, but my, my point in all that is, is, is that um, I, having an open mind about systemic racism and how to deal with it have to be part and parcel of this discussion because the lingering effects of the past continue to shape the thoughts of the present. Yeah, if you could go ahead and discuss some of the cases, the I, seminal cases in uh, this area. Absolutely. So I'd like to begin with this, this idea, and I hope we have an open mind of, of the cases we know and the cases that we don't know. And I want to start about the cases that we, we don't know. 
um, before I go to the big, the, the two big ones that I think are really important, I like to build sort of a mental time machine and, and go back to the 1960s to the Vietnam conflict. And so I, I once, um, I authored a book on Justice William O. Douglas and why Gerald Ford tried to impeach him when Ford was in Congress. And Douglas became very outspoken against the Vietnam War and acted in a manner that usually you don't see Supreme Court justices doing in the 20th century. He sort of got in hot water for, for that. But one of Justice Douglas's concerns um, is, is that in, in the period of the Vietnam War, you have roughly 29 ma males who are eligible to be drafted in the country. And roughly 60% of men um, do avoid the draft for one reason um, or another, including exemptions and deferments. Um, the, the, the commission that the, that the Lyndon Johnson administration established um, and put the pre former president of IBM as, as the head, so it was very data-driven, discovered something that most of us understand today that conscription was heavily weighted against the poor and against men, young men of color. But on, on top of that, in Georgia and in South Carolina, there's not one single male or female of color serving on the civilian led draft boards. And so you can imagine draft um, deferments and draft exemptions are going to correlate with that. So then let's transit into the Vietnam conflict and take a quick look at a press headline. There was a so-called prison riot, and it was a very violent riot at the Long Bin prison. The Long Bin prison was heavily populated by um, African-American soldiers who had committed petty crimes but had been convicted in court martials and were getting sent home. And the conditions of, those pr of that particular prison somewhat mirrored Attica or some of the more notorious state prisons in the United States, um, the prisoners were subjected to abuse and not surprisingly, there was a prison uprising. There was also drugs that were both being used by the military police and, and prisoners. But if you look at the headlines that are written about that at the day, it, it, it looks like a race riot and it looks like a race riot that um, was caused by the prisoners themselves without regard to, to prison treatment. And out of the long been prison, you have 40 more court martials coming out for crimes of assault and, and even sedition, which is a very unusual um, offense to charge someone with. It carries with it the death penalty. Of course, nobody got the death penalty as, as a result of the long been prison riots. I wanna focus though on one case that I find both compelling and, and important for us to consider, and it's a published decision called United States versus Johnson. And I'm not speaking about the president here. I'm speaking about a young combat tried private in the army whose last name was Johnson. And he was an artillery uh, troop. And uh, during a, an artillery um, bombardment in, in 1966, a, a young white lieutenant called him boy um, and had, had used other words of disrespect, but I don't know what those were because the Court of Appeals for the um, Army focuses on, on the word boy. Uh, the young Private Johnson threatened the lieutenant not to call him that again. The lieutenant called him that again, and then the young Private decked the lieutenant. He assaulted an officer, and if that's all you knew about the case, and what you understand about the military is that you, uh, an enlisted troop cannot assault a lieutenant, a lieutenant cannot assault a captain, you go up the rank without you know, serious penalty from occurring. But you have three very senior white colonels who are sitting on the bench after the court-martial conviction. And, and their, their focus on this word to me is fascinating. Um, so two of the colonels uphold the assault conviction, but they throw out the threat. And they're trying to parse out Private Johnson's actions. And what they're saying is, um, we understand why his immediate reaction was, was um, to, to threaten the lieutenant not to say it again. These words were insulting and the lieutenant should have understand it, understood that. Interestingly enough, the lieutenant admitted that in the court martial that he, he claimed he should, he should have understood that the word was insulting, but he didn't at the time that he made it. And then we get to the dissent by Judge Finkelstein. And Judge Finkelstein 
comes up with, you know, I'll read you the following line. I brought it up and, and I think this is important. Um, I won't repeat all of the words because I find them distasteful and difficult to repeat. But what he said is these events occurred at a time when over 5,000 Negro soldiers had been killed by hostile action in connection with the conflict in Vietnam. They disproportionately were serving in the ranks. 13 black soldiers had already earned the medal of honor. These were not boys. They were men in the finest sense of the word. These men have complained with documented justification of the denial of their manhood forced upon them by a society which at times has failed to afford them all of the rights, privileges, and appurtenances of full citizenship. The term boy reflects the real and figurative emasculation complained of so bitterly by citizens of this race concerned with interpersonal relations. The word is as profane and insulting, and then you can fill in the words for anti-Semitic words, um, uh, anti-Hispanic words, uh, words against Central Europeans, words against Asians. And so he, Judge Finkelstein is, is making the point clear that oftentimes when you're in the majority or you're within a system that has high expectations, um, you may not understand the impact of, of prejudice and race to the degree that you ought to. And I really like Judge Finkelstein's approach to this. He's not making an excuse at all for the assault. And of course, the conviction and the dishonorable discharge um, co comes up uh, and, and, and maintains. And Private Johnson, I tried to track him down. And because of privacy issues at the DOD, I'm not even sure if he's still alive today. I'd like to sit down with him and have a coffee and hear his side of the story. There are so many, my point in the unknown case is this, there are so many Private Johnsons in history, men of color that we don't know about, I think it's important to focus on them. I think it's important to look in um, the experiences they had to, to do a study, for example, in a group of some thousand young men who had very low IQs and were known as Robert McNamara's idiots because they weren't, they normally wouldn't have been admitted into the army and they had that derisive term. They were admitted because you can get children to do anything. The DOD thought, well, you could probably get young men and many of them were young men of color with low IQs to do anything and some of them had no idea why they were chosen but they served honorably and bravely in Vietnam um, on the front lines of that conflict but it would be interesting to see what their post-military lives were like and how many of them were disciplined or court-martialed that we don't know about and that's an ongoing study. Let me turn to two important cases that we we do know about in the sense that one there was just a movie made on, from world war one on on one and, and that has to do with the houston riot and i want to look at that one last but i'd like to look at burns versus wilson first and that's a united states supreme court decision and i i want to look at burns versus wilson not so much as what the court says in the majority, um, it's a very badly written decision uh, that was um, published in 1953, but the underlying facts of what happened. A, an African-American Air Force sergeant and two African-American um, uh, airmen were, were convicted for the rape and murder of a white PX worker, and at least two of those men had pretty good alibis, making it highly unlikely that they would have been guilty of the crime that, that was charged. Um, they were charged prior to the UCMJ, and the, the trial itself had no military appeals to it because none existed at the time. It was right after World War II on the island of Guam, which was run by the United States Navy. The chief of police on the island of Guam was a retired police captain from the city of Chicago. So you may know where this is going. He used the Chicago method to extract a confession out of a young Eugene Dennis. Um, Dennis was beaten to a pulp before he confessed and out of the blue, he named um, Burns and the other Dennis, there was no relation. Um, the men were defended uh, by military defense counsel, but they were also convicted and sentenced to death. It's more likely that the rape and murder that occurred occurred from, there was a hair found on, on the victim, and it's more likely that the rape and murder occurred uh, or was committed by a, a white sailor or airman on, on the island um, because the hair certainly um, belonged to someone who was a redhead, um, and neither the victim nor the three men had red hair. 
Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that it was the redheaded male who did it, but it, it, it shows you there's an issue in the, in the case. Um, both the Dennis and Burns who are sentenced to death are, are executed. But when you look at the traverse of the case to their execution, it's absolutely appalling. Um, in spite of the fact that Justice Frankfurter in his dissent casts considerable doubt on the fairness of the court martial and insists on the innocence of the men. And in spite of the fact that Justice Douglas and Black do likewise in separate dissents, Black and Douglas on the one hand and Frankfurter despised each other. So even though they said the same things in their dissent, they were unwilling to sign a single dissent by this point. Um, they, they were, um, the, the, the men were sentenced to death. They, they, uh, even after that uh, dissent, they appealed to the Eisenhower administration. They appealed directly to Earl Warren on his first day as Supreme Court justice to put a stay on it. And yet uh, none of that worked and, and the two men were executed. They were executed, I think, on the same day as Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, um, who were uh, two Jewish scientists, husband and wife, who were accused of giving sec atomic secrets to the Soviet Union. And so the Burns and Dennis um, execution didn't get the media play that the Rosenberg um, trial got. And I have strong feelings on the Rosenberg trial. I'll caveat that by saying even if they were guilty, they were tried under the same law. The Soviets already had the information that they allegedly gave them, and the tr that trial was ridden um, with anti-Semitism throughout. So it's not a case of one, un you know, one fascinating trial stopping an unjust trial. It's a case of two um, unjust events, um, one trumping the other in the media eye. Uh, to this day, if I had a wish list and I have time, I'd like to get on a project to try to do a posthumous pardon. And that leads me to the Houston trial. Um, now, the Houston mutiny trial uh, existed in World War I, and, and there's no court of appeals at that time, and there's no direct review by the Supreme Court. The, the way the law worked in those days is as long as the United States Supreme Court, um, as long as the United States Supreme Court determined that the military had proper jurisdiction over soldiers, meaning the soldiers weren't really civilians, you go back to the Milligan case for that, then the federal judiciary could not intervene. So in three waves of trial, multiple honorably serving African-American men in uniform who were fed up with um, racist treatment by uh, Houston residents, by the Houston Police Department, um, were, were sentenced to death and, and were executed until President Wilson, whose record on race is miserable to begin with, um, put a stop on the last series of executions. The, I've written about this, and I'm not plugging my own book. I, please, I'm not plugging my own book, but I've actually written about this in a World War I, uh, a book on, on the Judge Advocate General and, and the, the, the widespread duties they had during World War I and how it was a usurpation of, of um, civil military relations, but only temporary at, at the time. Um, the, the interesting thing about the, of the many interesting things that, about the Houston mutiny is that the, the first round of executions begins before the White House even knows the trial occurred. That's how rapid it was. And, and so the judge advocate general, General Enoch Crowder, had no idea that the trial had taken place, the executions had been issued, because that's the way military law worked back then. But ultimately, the men were given a posthumous pardon. Now, what's the importance of a posthumous pardon? Um, some people will say it's not a big deal. Look, the British haven't done posthumous pardons for the shot at dawn trials they had in World War I. They executed over 700 men for cowardice um, by, and violated their own articles of war. They were trench trials um, of people who probably had nothing more than you know uh, PTSD at the time, or as they called it, shell shock. Um, the, the value of posthumous pardons, though, is, and I think President Clinton did this well in the Houston mutiny trials, is this. It's, it's that it causes the current military and the current Congress to remember that there's an important value to equal treatment under the law. And here we are in the year 2021, and you may be familiar with the General Accountability Office report. It's not an internal DOD um, investigation, although there have been some. 
but the 2021 or 2020 GAO report that says if you are an African American male in the military, you are more than doubly likely to have court martial charges brought against you. Now, that's an astounding figure in the year 2021. And it's partly astounding to me for this reason. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy, in his first year of office, commissioned a study on race relations in the military, and he appointed a New Deal attorney that had been William O. Douglas's clerk um, to, to head that, and also the former head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, a, judge, uh, a future U.S. District Court judge named Gerhard Gazelle. And Gerhard Gazelle, in his investigation of Army and Air Force bases, concluded that of course, the military is a microcosm of society, but commanders, either they're not trained or they don't understand the importance of looking at things in a case-by-case -case basis from the very root. And that is, why is the sergeant telling me that Private Joe Smith needs to be court-martialed, but Private you know, Bernie Schwartz doesn't and can be rehabilitated? And the military needs to keep a year-by-year -year account on who they're taking to trial because there are gross inequities in the promotion, retention, and court-martial system in the military. And, you know, if Gerhard Gazelle came up with that in 1962 through some really imp both empirical and interview-type data and a comprehensive support, and then, of course, G Gazelle went on to serve as a judge on the Oliver North trial and, and, and some of the Watergate trials um, later. It's a very bright man. Um, we're still having this discussion in the year 2021 here and not as a historic artifact, but how reckoning with the past needs to be continual and guide us into the future. And that goes back, and I'll wrap up, to my comment on the War of 1812. It's so long ago that we tend to forget about it. And in fact, it's called America's Forgotten War for a reason. The US doesn't fight it particularly well. The Brits burn the White House down, right? Or they sack Washington, DC. Um, and it was a silly war to go into. That wasn't very popular in New England um, and other places among Federalists. But but if, if, you, if you open up some boxes that have been closed for over 100 years and you have the luck to go through court martial records like I had, and they're, they're, they're penned and they're calligraphy. One of the things you notice, though, is who is in the privileged place of society and not serving and who the wall of court martials descend upon. And they descend upon the least favored people in the Virginia militia poor white farmers and freedmen, and who benefits the most? Those who are benefited the most by racial disparities. And this is not me speaking in a Marxist overtone. Trust me when I say this, I'm the furthest person from being a Marxist. I, I really am. Um, and I, I, I get upset when I hear about BLM being compared to or being a Marxist front. It's the same old tried argument that people like Strom Thurmond raised against Martin Luther King. It's just it's not reality. Um, but but my point in that is, is that structures remain. And I don't mean structures like buildings and laws. I mean, structures like implicit bias and reckoning with the past helps us overcome the structure of implicit bias, and it's a road to do so. And so I think I'm running short of time. And I've been asked for a case citation on Johnson. I'll type it into the chat right now, and I'm open to questions. You get uh, to put your questions in the Q&A. We're going to go to our next panelist. After the two other panelists speak, you will, you will go to your questions. Um, we are now going to go to Lieutenant Colonel Kerry Ritchie. And Kerry, there was a question about statistics. Does the Army even know how many African-Americans, Hispanics have served, serving? If you can include that in your response, but it's open to you. What are you passionate? Why are you passionate about this topic? And what can you share to educate our audience about the past, present, and future of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Right. First, I did provide a link to an infographic in the uh, Q&A um, that shows you the numbers that DOD is counting in 2020 for um, Hispanics serving on active duty. Um, so why I'm passionate, um, I think first I'd like to take you through a visualization exercise very briefly. 
Um, so if you would bear with me, um, imagine if you will, that you are a reporter 15 years in the future, and you're there to look at army innovations. So picture this, close your eyes, you get to an army hospital and the army commander, the hospital commander greets you very warmly, probably not with a handshake because we're post COVID. So maybe an elbow bump or something, <laughs> but you lock eyes and this commander is very excited to show you what uh, innovations we have 15 years from now. Um, so the commander takes you to a non-commissioned officer in a surgical ward, the non-commissioned officer talks to you very anim animated and is able to demonstrate in a very sterile environment, um, this innovation of a machine, a, a robot that can perform surgery, but the person performing the surgery is in another state or even another country. This is amazing for the battlefield to be able to have this technology and it's now here. Um, I want you to think of one other scenario, again, a reporter 15 years in the future looking at innovation, uh, but this time you're at a training area and you're greeted by the general officer who tells you, my non-commissioned officer is gonna show you what we're gonna be doing now on the battlefield. And you get a demonstration of a robotic vehicle um, that is you know, capable of, of performing combat and it's operated remotely. The non-commissioned officer, again, very animated, looks at you directly and says, this is, the future is now. This is amazing. So you've gotten these two glimpses of these great innovations from the future. So open your eyes and I want you to think about who did you picture as you were going to these places? Who was the army uh, hospital commander? Was it a a male? Was it a female? Was it a Caucasian? Was it a Hispanic, African American? Uh, when you looked at the non-commissioned officer, same question. The general officer, non-commissioned officer out on the field. In today's army, it really can be anyone. Uh, but who did you picture and how is that informed? Is it from movies that you've seen or different war stories from, uh, from television shows? what forms your vision of what a soldier looks like. Um, I'm passionate about this because in today's army, it really is possible for anyone to become any of those roles, but there are still barriers that need to be lifted. Um, I want you to also think about those innovations that, you know, the robotic vehicles and the remote uh, operating center, these are real. These are real innovations that are being developed now and tested. Um, was it hard for you to imagine those as opposed to, was it hard for you to imagine maybe an African-American hospital commander, which is also an innovation. So I, I just want you to think, keep that in your mind. And this is, this is what I'm passionate about is that we have to um, engage our own understanding of reality. And we have to really make this, uh, make this real uh, diversity, you know, it's not going to succeed if we're not invested in it and, and, and willing to recognize perhaps our own unconscious biases. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen to talk to you a little bit about what DOD is doing um, today. So this is what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, first, what's going on? What are the recent initiatives um, and why? Why diversity, equity and, and inclusion? What's the big deal? Um, and where are we today? And where are we going? So, there we go. Um, so, what's going on? These are the major uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives of late. Um, I think one of the biggest milestones came in 2009 when Congress authorized the creation of the Military Leadership Diversity Commission, uh, which issued a report. And uh, in that report, many, many of the recommendations um, informed the military moving forward on diversity and inclusion. Um, and in 2012, there was a five-year diversity and inclusion strategic plan that was developed um, both for uh, military and civilian. Um, now, bringing it more up to date, 
There wasn't a lot going on between 2012 and 2020, but there was a lot contained in that uh, MLDC report and that was being implemented, but there weren't a lot of new, um, new issuances per se. Um, in 2020, we had the horrific death of George Floyd and the military acted fairly swiftly. In June, then Secretary of Defense Mark Esper issued a memo. Um, he directed a three-prong approach for promoting diversity and inclusion in the services. Um, and I've listed them here uh, and just think about how uh, bureaucracies and military is a bureaucracy, how they work. This is incredible fast timing and a, you know, a lot that has taken place um, in the last, uh, last year or so. So um, he required that the services identify immediate actions for improving diversity and inclusion. And on July 14th, he issued a memo that listed what immediate actions could be taken. Then he did sort of a midterm task, which was to create a, a diversity and inclusion board. That board was stood up and met in uh, July and immediately issued a report by the end of the year. So by December 17th, we received a detailed uh, report from that board. And then uh, the secretary also directed um, the creation of the Defense Advisory Committee on Diversity and Inclusion. And that charter uh, did um, publish in August of 2020. Uh, and the idea there was the long-term view. This is a, an advisory committee that will continue to advise DOD on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and to oversee those. Um, so why, why, why diversity, equity, and inclusion? I will share with you the views of DOD, which I share as well. Uh, and here are some examples. So in the, DO, in the DOD DEI statement that um, Patricia Harris read earlier, you see some of these concepts uh, repeating itself. The key to innovation, again, I, it, this is innovation and it needs to be embraced. Um, you see cohesive teamwork, total force readiness. Um, DOD is about making sure that we have the uh, best fighting force and for total force readiness, uh, DOD sees diversity, equity, inclusion as necessary. Um, in the DOD strategic plan that was uh, published in 2012, there was this idea of capitalizing on this broad range of talent. So when we did the visualization, visualization exercise, you, we need talented people to be able to harness these innovations that are, uh, that are coming for the military that continue, the military is frequently at the forefront of innovation and we need the best talent and diversity will ensure that. Um, we also need to reach out to these diverse communities to, to compete for that top talent. That was part of that strategic plan as well. Um, the idea being that if you only have one, um, if you remain stagnant in your population, your pool, then your innovation remains stagnant as well. You need a, a diverse pool of talent to really reach um, the best and most innovative um, programs. Um, so Secretary Esper also issued in that June uh, 2020 memo gave a, another glimpse of why this is important. He talked about morale, cohesion and readiness. So for a fighting force, that is critical. And if our ranks don't feel that they're, uh, that they're respected or included, morale, cohesion and readiness will suffer. Um, he also talks a little bit here about reflecting um, you know, the American people. So that is a constant theme for DOD as well, is that the, our force to support and defend the United States, we should also have a force that reflects those that we defend our country. Um, and then at the, the last uh, quote also uh, from the same memo from Secretary, uh, former Secretary Esper, he again recognizes that uh, there is an enterprise-wide organizational um, need to, um, to reject hate and prejudice, uh, to have an organizational and culture shift. Um, and he, he recognizes that the military should reflect the values of the country um, and so this leads into this idea that diversity, equity, and inclusion, well, why? Well, one reason is that these are the values of our country, um, whether uh, 
There may be individuals who don't embrace it, but this is, these are the overall values of our nation uh, from its founding. Um, so one more on this. Um, I really like this paragraph, uh, and this comes from, again, uh, former Secretary of Defense uh, Esper, who talks, this is the memo that he issued in implementing um, the actions in, in directing the services to take these immediate actions. And I think this paragraph really kind of sums up all of the why, why diversity. Uh, he talks about moral imperative, uh, mission readiness, efficacy, demographic representation, uh, fairness, transparency, leadership, um, achieving the mission ready fighting force in the 21st century, uh, and diversity of thought and perspective to ensure our strategic advantage. Um, those are many of the reasons you probably can think of more, but uh, it, this is the why uh, for DOD, why diversity. So where are we now? Um, these uh, statistics come from the DOD Board on Diversity and Inclusion. And I believe in the resources for this webinar, there is a link um, that provides you with that report. Um, so currently the active component, the enlisted population is slightly more racially and ethnically diverse uh, for the US population. Um, it is not so for the officer grades. Um, notably, the officer corps is significantly less racially and ethnically diverse than the enlisted population uh, for both the active and reserve components and less ethnically and racially diverse than the US uh, population. Um, so this is an area that needs focus, leadership um, to reflect our country, the country that the, the military uh, defends we need a more diverse leadership. That is the, the biggest area that the board found lacking uh, of diversity, equity, inclusion in 2020. So where are we going? Um, I wanted to share this quote because I, I, I really like it. it. It says leaders must acknowledge that increasing demographic diversity does not by itself increase effectiveness. What matters is how an organization harnesses diversity and whether it's willing to reshape its power structure. And I see this in relation to the military as going back to the leadership is woefully short of being a diverse reflection of society. Uh, so where we're going, we need to address that shortfall. And this is taken from the uh, defense, uh, the Department of Defense Board on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusions report. And this is an infographic that they use to show, uh, you know, how in uh, in the business world, in civil society, uh, in industry, diversity and, and inclusion has evolved. And it's you can then see the parallels to the military. Uh, so, you know, in the 20th century, there is the demographic representation. And uh, in the business world, you often heard of the, um, the, the business case for diversity and just increasing numbers. Um, then in the 2000s, there's this idea of inclusion and diversity leadership and requiring a, a more diverse leadership and training leadership um, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you only trained, you know, if, you, if this becomes a requirement that uh, everyone's gonna get training, what are the odds that the leadership at the top is going to really dive into it? Um, so it really has to be leaders down. Um, and then in the 2020s, now we come to equity and community building. We talk about focusing on social, ecological, um, individual, interpersonal, and organizational allyship between leaders and the marginal, margin, what's called marginalized persons. Um, and amplifying the silenced voices. This is where DOD is heading with the re recent reports that were published and the, the, um, the steps that they are taking. It's, it's matching more this model now, going beyond just increasing numbers and actually harnessing the diversity to be a more effective fighting force. Um, and so the last slide I wanna share is, sorry, uh, there we go. 
these are just the immediate steps that, uh, that were outlined um, in 2020 uh, in Secretary Esper's memo. Um, so you can see some of these, for example, removing photographs that goes to the unconscious bias. Um, further down, it's develop educational requirements for implementation across the military life cycle to educate the force on unconscious bias. So you can see that these are the next steps for uh, DOD and the development of improving diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, within the forces. Um, what's important to note is that um, the way this is carried out, it's carried out by the services. And so all of this direction coming from DOD has to be carried out uh, in practice by the services. Um, so this is, I, I am very passionate about this. I wanted to share with you where we are now. Um, and then I believe our next speaker will be able to give you a little bit more of a bird's eye view of one uh, department's actions and where, uh, where we're going presently in implementing these policies. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. There was one question about, have you heard if um, the Secretary of Defense, the new Secretary of Defense is changing the board um, the DOD advisory board or not. I have not heard that there was a change. Uh, no, there is not a change and I don't believe there will be. There would be no uh, reason to. Um, the board is a long-term um, board. You may have heard there was a, there is a defense advisory committee on women in the services that's been very uh, successful and helpful in providing advice um, to DOD and modeled after that, this board should be a long-term. Um, it should survive any administration, we hope, <laughs> um, because of the, the, the great service that it provides. And it is advisory in nature. That means that the department doesn't have to take its recommendations, but um, you know, it, it, it provides that kind of uh, outside insight that will help the department as it moves forward. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. It wouldn't stop. Let me see if I'm still muted. Okay, wrong You're one. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Oh, not anymore. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, there now we'll get to now. Commander yeah. Sarah DeGroote. Mm -hmm. How are you? Um, why are you passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what would you share with us about the past, present, or future uh, in this area related to the military? Right. Well, thank you. Um, well, first, I have to caveat everything with these are my own personal opinions. I do not represent the Department of the Navy or, or DOD. Um, even though I'm on active duty, these are my own personal opinions and thoughts. So I'm South Asian. Uh, I joined um, and was commissioned in 2003 right out of law, uh, while I was in law school in my second year of law school into the Navy. Um, right around the surge when the surge was going into Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and, and, I, and I served in Iraq and you can imagine being a brown South Asian woman in the military as we're heading into um, the Middle East where a lot of times most Americans don't understand geography, not most, some Americans don't understand the geography and who comes from where. And so I, um, in my personal life, is, have often been lumped and, and not understood my background. And even in the military, um, comments have been made um, I, during my service, especially during that time frame in, in 05 to, to about 2010. But I'm passionate about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion because I care about the mission. I care about the mission of the Navy, and I care about um, the people who, who we serve as lawyers. Um, I'm a military justice practitioner in this role. I've been a defense attorney, I've been a victim's legal counsel, and I've been a prosecutor. And as a military justice practitioner, I think it's really important for us to be aware of our own unconscious biases and how we advise um, convening authorities and how we choose to advise as staff judge advocates and as other uh, legal professionals, how we advise our commanding officers and our, um, our military leaders 
on, on ways forward. So that's why I'm really passionate about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in our um, service. And I was thinking back to September 2000, 2016, then CNO Richardson had his, um, created the uh, Navy Leadership Framework Guidance 3.0. And in that, he clearly stated that we are a diverse community and we serve and have allies who are very diverse. So it's very important for us to embrace that diversity, to understand our unconscious biases and embrace those who are different from us, to have different perspectives in the room. And that will increase our competence and our ability to, to really push the mission. Sino you know, Gilday said, when, sa when sailors feel included, respected, and empowered, they are mission ready. And when our sailors trust our leadership, trust that their point of view, who they are, that they will be included and treated equitably, despite their backgrounds, their race, their gender, um, that just increases the mission. So after DOD and um, Secretary of Defense Esper, uh, had put out their report, Task Force One Navy um, was stood up in July 1st, 2020, last year, and it was under the umbrella of the culture of excellence. And so I can only speak of the Navy. I can't speak of any of the other branches I'm most familiar with, with Task Force One Navy. And they had four lines of effort, recruiting, retention, professional development, and innovation, specifically in the STEM fields. Not I don't really know much about STEM. I, I became a lawyer <laughs> and I didn't do uh, intellectual property or anything like that. But what I did find fascinating is that by increasing their, um, the recommendation was to increase involvement in K through 12 STEM access and to get in there and to, to uh, provide opportunities for those who historically did not receive opportunity from the Navy. Uh, to, to be inspired by innovation, to be inspired by science. It's inspiring to, to see that support of the Navy mission from, from an earlier stage. From Task Force One Navy, 56 Navy uh, recommendations were, were given. A lot of them mirror what um, DOD recommendations were out of their report, but some of them that were um, really important, I think, and, and struck me, have to do with uh, recruiting and really working with historically Black colleges and other colleges that typically were not, um, we were not recruiting from, working with them to enhance their ROTC programs. Many of our minority officers come from ROTC programs, so we should be investing in, in personnel who can provide um, diverse opportunities and not continue to in, in, to continue to embrace that diversity and embrace um, our our talented officers from from those locations in career development and mentorship it was noticed that when people came up for flag um, and opportunities to be flag some many minority officers didn't have the background in order to be competitive for those flag officers, um, for those flag billets. The question is why? When did that happen? Was it lack of mentorship from the beginning? Were they not receiving uh, guidance because those above them weren't looking to them to, to mentor them and to bring them um, on? I, I want to focus on the JAG Corps in specific, the Navy JAG Corps in specific. In November 2020, uh, Vice Admiral Hannick created the Standing Advisory on um, Standing Advisory Council on Inclusion and Diversity. And we as lawyers have been looking at retention, recruiting, mentorship, and community engagement, understanding uh, how wh why people stay or leave um, the military. And these are all important for us as JAGs. Because as I talked about, we advise commanders. We advise commanders on rules of engagement. We advise commanders on um, military justice, on NJP. The GAO uh, is doing a study. And in the Navy, we have not been collecting the um, race of, of many people who are going to, um, to court-martial and NJP. We are now. 
uh, but there's not a lot of uh, data to really say for sure what is happening. But what the data is showing um, a little bit right now is that on the administrative level, on the NJP, the um, Article 15 level, there is a disproportionate impact on minority sailors. And so as, um, as a JAG who's advising con convening authorities and commanders, we should be that voice that talks about these things, that considers um, to, to give them uh, a perspective that's important. Um, the GAO report and the data that has been collected so far does say when it reaches the charging level with the attorneys on the court martial level, at least in the Navy, that it does even out um, a lot more and that sentencing seems to be fairly equal. But we're standing by, of course, for more data as, um, as we collect it and, and find out about it. But I do think we are headed in the right direction, and I'm I'm very uh, positive for the future. As a South Asian, I'm really in, excited about uh, a perspective on grooming. Uh, we have many Sikhs who want to serve in the uh, in the military and who are serving in the military. Sorry, I have a motion censored uh, light switch in my office. Uh, we can still see you clearly. You can still see me great, thank you. <laughs> um, we have, we have uh, people who, but for religious reasons, can't comply with uh, grooming standards. And the Navy is now grappling with it. The Army, um, a, a suit was filed. I am blanking on uh, the name of the case right now, but it is now allowed in the Army for Sikhs to wear turbans. Uh, when when serving and and now the Navy uh, is going to be grap or should be grappling with it and and policies are being looked at grooming policies are being looked at it's not just for South Asians but also African Americans who um, for hairstyles and and other grooming it's really important because to be who you are to have a um, a community that allows you to be authentic while still serving the mission and supporting the mission I think is hugely important, especially as our, our forces are gonna be looking at blended retirement that allows our folks to, to leave early without the carrot of the 20 year pension um, and, and a rising healthcare costs for, for our retirees. So these are all important. DEI is important to, to encourage loyalty and in support of the mission. Over. Thank you so much. That was uh, excellent. Um, I appreciate all of our panelists so far. We're going to make sure you put your questions in chat. We're going to open it up. They're not in chat. In Q&A, there's a Q&A box next to, to the left of the chat. Put your questions in q and I'm going to stop for uh, as you uh, do that and present um, some announcements relative to the American Bar Association, so I can give you time to put your questions in chat. So let me get to those slides. Okay. We urge you to get and stay involved. There are a number of ways for attorneys to get involved with efforts and initiatives for service members and veterans. And you have some examples here, including the American Bar Association's Military and Veterans Legal Clinic, Legal Center, there's a, uh, a uh, link that you can follow to get to their website. You can explore resources and opportunities, uh, and it brings together all of the ABA entities, programs, and projects that are focused on our military and our veterans and their families. There are also always CLEs that you can participate in. Um, you can, again, there is a link um, that's for the CLE that's um, ambar.org slash lamp CLE, and that should be in chat for you to follow as well. And then there are a number of pro bono programs that you can also participate in. Um, the ABA Military Pro Bono Project accepts cases, case referrals from military legal assistance attorneys who are helping the junior enlisted service members who are facing civil legal issues. And we're working to you know, help make sure that they get um, the support they need um, through volunteer attorneys. So if you want to participate in that, you're an attorney and you have the ability to participate as a pro bono attorney, we'd uh, love for you to join us. 
Um, the cases include family law matters, creditor and consumer issues, landlord tenant matters, and other civil legal issues. Again, there's the link to sign up for that. And there's always the ABA free legal answers as well. This is a virtual legal advice clinic. The ABA is, is, is uh, involved in our veterans and our military. They want to be a resource that you can utilize. So please check out those free legal answers for some questions that are frequently asked. Um, there's questions about discharge upgrades, VA disability, and other VA benefits. And again, you get these free uh, of charge as a, free, a, bon a, pre a pro bono service. We have a upcoming July the 7th, uh, we have an, uh, an, a book coming out, um, Military Discharge Upgrade Legal Practice Manual. You can pre-order that. We also have a, a, a membership. Uh, consider joining. We urge you to join. You will get so much for your participation. The, again, we've talked about some of the things. There's different um, committees, the different uh, uh, sections of the, the bar that uh, meet together. And so you can participate in that. Uh, and then there are uh, varying fees depending on what your uh, status is as a military member, as a discount, if you're a government attorney as a discount. Um, so please consider doing joining the American Bar Association. And then I already talked about the book. Uh, okay. So let me look to our question and answers to see if what questions we have in there. Um, I know we have. While you're doing that, I just wanted to follow up. I, I misunderstood the question about the Defense Advisory Committee. I don't know about the composition of that committee. I thought the question was whether the committee itself would continue, but That's as far as the too. committee members, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what's happening with the composition of the committee. So I apologize for misspeaking earlier. Okay. Okay, so we have a question um, from Alexander Flores. So may, hopefully I get it right. Uh, regarding military justice, it feels as though, and this is for anyone, it feels as though trial counsel operating in a smaller fighting hole aren't able to extrapolate larger trends in investigations, uh, non-judicial punishment is NJP, administrative separation and charging decisions either in a particular command or at a higher level. So he's talking about being able to get the resources of, of uh, pr prior cases, uh, prior investigations when you're in a small location. Um, if the trial counsel can't harness the data, who should, who should be looking at this data? Mm. And how should trial counsel who are interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion act on those principles without the data or a higher enough perch to present or comment on trends. So if you're at a small post and you don't have the trends, you don't know what's going on, who is the person that should be watching this uh, from your perspective, if anybody has a, can answer that? Who should be paying attention to the trends? Who should be paying attention to the, the numbers of people who are being uh, punished or going through administrative separations or given NJP um, at a at, at the local level or high. Is anybody right? So I can. And answer. I hope I got that right, Alexander. <laughs> yeah. So I think I can answer um, at, at least from my perspective. So Wolverine is what the Navy uses, the Marine Corps uses in order to input um, court martial data, and, and that includes what we're now tracking, which is race um, and and uh, other factors like gender, as well. But, um, and that only recently started in accordance with, I believe, the NDAA. We are also tracking on the NJP level through QCAR, which is a, and I, I can't remember, I've gotten so used to acronyms, I've forgotten what the acronyms stand for sometimes, but QCAR is provided to all commands, and they are supposed to be reporting their data um, up in order to, and that includes who goes to NJP, what are the results, uh, gender, race, all that other stuff. Um, so I think for trial counsel, in my opinion, uh, you can pull from Wolverine uh, when it's up and running perfectly. You should be able to pull from Wolverine for your own area, what some trends are. But even within your own um, trial counsel, de trial department, working with your senior trial counsel to, to work through 
do you see unconscious bias working through investigations? And I'm sure if, if you are working with an NCIS agent who you believe has issues with unconscious bias, it's very important as a prosecutor to be able to work with them. But I think within your own trial department, you can pull those trends from, from Wolverine. But I think what you're asking about is even bigger than that with convening authorities. And I think that is going to be within with the administrative piece. And that's what the QCAR, thank you. Yes, <laughs> I could not remember what it stood for. So I definitely appreciate that. Uh, so looking at, at the QCAR, um, those are being looked at and you can always I'm going to put a shout out for Code 20, who is collecting a lot of data. Code 20 for the Navy is collecting the, the Navy data. And I think you can reach out to them if you have any questions. Over. Anybody else? Okay. I, I agree that you definitely got to be looking at the local level to see what are your trends. So if you can impact your, your own local level and educate um, then you've already made a difference. Even, but as she said, I think even in the army, they have now start. They they had a the program which I can't think of what it is now. Military justice reporter, military justice report um, that you could um, access and get that type of data as well. Yeah, okay. and and can I just add? I think also that it is it is yes at the local level, but it is also a bigger project. I know the Army has created a center at Fort Belvoir, I forget what it's called, that was recently stood up um, to kind of be that, that larger level, not just for diversity, uh, but for military justice. And a piece of that should be um, looking at trends, diversity trends, um, and sharing that with the, um, with, with the different offices. Um, there are some difficulties, uh, you know, it, there's information that can be shared within the military, it can't always be 100% transparent when it comes to administrative actions, there are some privacy rights, and depending even on the, the uh, outcome of a court martial, there are some privacy rights that attach that make it difficult to be 100% transparent, but certainly um, there should be some trend analysis and it should be made available broadly. I think um, if you're trying to look at the DOD as a whole, one of the problems that the GAO report focused in on is that the service branches all had, to the extent they had um, tracking systems and accountability, none of them were integrated. And you, you were forced to look at five different, um, you know, if you wanted to, to, to know. Um, and I just I, I throw that out there. I mean, if you're in a try, if you're a defense counsel and you're looking at selective prosecution, unless the law has changed, and I don't think it has, you're really only looking within your general court martial convening authorities area. But if you're an enterprising defense counsel and you're seeking to raise that, and you want mega data, then you 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 have the GAO report. But I don't know where else you can can go until the service is standardized. Thank you. Um, this is a question that's not, well, it's, it's kind of on point with um, edu helping our service members beyond mentors and sponsors in the service. Says, are there programs available to help potential service members know about pathways and careers in the service? Anybody want to answer that? I'm not very familiar with uh, recruiting initiatives. Um, you know, there are, of course, the junior ROTC programs in, in certain high schools that are very helpful in that regard. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure how recruiters um, do their work, but they do um, have recruiting offices all over the country, and that is their mission. And I also know I'll get a phone call from someone who knows I was in the military and I help as much as I possibly can to say my experience and what careers are, you know, up and coming and <laughs> uh, mostly the law. But yes, I, I don't know of anything formal, but the mentors and sponsors are very key in our military to help you navigate when you first come in the door. So those are, are very key. OK, I, I will yes. agree. There are definitely some uh, the, the Navy is looking definitely at NROTC. Uh, to improve minority applications, to work with K through 12 um, schools in order to, to start, not recruiting is the wrong word, but to help innovate um, 
and provide them with opportunities. So there are a lot of ways, including even once you're in, uh, having opportunities for some of our enlisted members who are very educated, more educated than some officers, not have to go through OCS and, and well, go through an IPP program where their direct commission beyond uh, outside of the, the LDO, uh, the limited duty officer process. So there's lots of things that are being looked at in order to increase not just racial, gender, and other uh, diversity, but per, per, uh, diversity of perspective um, that I think are being pushed uh, in, in the coming years. And one thing I, I would note is that it, this is not just a one-time push. The one thing that makes this push for DEI different, I feel from previous um, iterations of, of looking at uh, diversity and inclusion is that you have our senior leadership, our Secretary of Defense, our Secretary of the Navy, our CNO, really pushing these and really behind them. And I think that is very important for our sailors and our, and our Marines um, and guardians and airmen. And uh, so I'm sure I forgot so many soldiers to, to see, to really see our senior leadership behind this. And that's very important. I'm gonna share my screen for another, a quote and then a question. I think it's important, like you said, to see what's, what's happening currently. And this is a quote from the Army um, Judge Advocate General, who it was a, a great quote because the, the lawyers have to be involved in this area. Um, let's see here. That's not it. Uh, here we go. Okay. Our people are our most precious resource. I got to get it so I can see it. Sorry. I am a former Army Judge Advocate, 28 years military service, so the Army is near and dear to my heart. Um, and so I quote uh, our current TJAG, our people are our most precious resource, soldiers, civilians, family members, how we value each other and how we receive, each perceive the resulting treatment matters. It matters because it is the essence of who we are and what we represent. How we treat each other reflects our values and our values arise from our commitment to what is right, fair, and just, which are the foundations of our shared promise, equal justice under the law for all. So I am going to go to Carrie with a specific question. She's also a former Army JAG and you didn't give us your back, little bit of your background, Carrie. Um, you were recently involved in uh, writing a letter uh, with some other retirees to the Army. Why was that important to you? Right, so as the um, these initiatives were rolled out, um, some of us took note of this time, this moment in time to seize the opportunity and share our experiences and hopefully help those coming um, after us. And uh, there were, as we looked at the different uh, recommendations that were coming out, there were still some that more that we felt that could be done. And the only way to get that out there was to let, to, to inform our leadership. So um, Patricia, you marshaled the troops and uh, many of us felt that as retired judge advocates, we would be more, um, more willing to be very direct and to not beat around the bush we did not feel uh, concerned that there would be retribution or that it would reflect badly on us. We felt we could speak our minds and that it was important to do so. Uh, so we got together and we uh, sent a letter to um, the, uh, the SECDEF and copied uh, the, the, the Army uh, Chief of Staff as well as um, uh, TJAG to let them know of some of our experiences and experiences of our colleagues that we felt created barriers to uh, advancement within um, the Judge Advocate General Corps. Uh, and we just really saw that as necessary, even though there are sensing sessions and other information gathering going on within the military, being retired, we felt we, uh, we could do that very openly and without fear uh, of retribution. Could you also, can you say what you recently participated in? And Yeah, yes. I was going to mention that as well. Um, as we're talking about diversity, I think uh, gender diversity is another aspect of the military that's very important to move forward. 
Um, I was a member of the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee. We spent 20 days at Fort Hood last fall uh, looking at um, basically the command climate and culture and how it affected uh, the uh, climate, you know, the ability of service members, the the uh, readiness of the troops at Fort Hood. And um, it was very eye-opening. I had spent three years at Fort Hood myself um, in the 90s as a trial counsel, as a prosecutor. So um, going back to Fort Hood um, this many years later, it was very eye-opening to see um, some of the difficulties that still remained. Um, some things had not changed at all. Some things had actually gotten worse. Um, and we were very, uh, it was a panel of five highly qualified experts. So we were outside of the military, we were independent and we were able to speak our minds and to call it like we saw it. Um, so we produced a 130 page report out of that. Uh, what I took away um, many, many things, but what is still in my heart is the stories of the women um, and, and the, um, the harassment and, and many sexual assaults that were recounted to me and uh, you know, just heart-wrenching stories. Um, our women should not in any, in any environment um, have to endure that. And we certainly aren't going to move forward with um, uh, receiving the best and brightest uh, women in the military if that's the way we're going to treat them. Now this is not, I don't mean to generalize, this was not to say that all women in the military are being treated that way, but there should be no occurrences of this and the occurrences within, at this location with these combat units was, uh, was unbelievably high. Um, so that is something that the, the army is facing head on and is addressing. I believe we're on a great path um, and that with continued attention and, and uh, ensuring that the conversation doesn't uh, peter out and that actions continue to be taken to eliminate um, and to create this overall force that understands and respects one another. That's a part of the whole DNI initiative. And um, it, it was really lacking in many areas. And that is a big push. And I believe that we are. I still love the army, so I don't want to be quoted as bad mouthing the army, but I believe we're in a, in a better direction. As we have about eight minutes left, um, Professor Kastenberg, we have been underrepresented with minority officers in the senior ranks forever. Yeah. Do you see, would that make a difference, do you think, in some of the cases that the past and the future? if we do have a more equal um, representation of, my, of all minority officers? Yeah, absolutely. But I, I want to, I think I'd like to make a comment on that because I, I agree with you about underrepresentation. But the military, like so many things that are part of American culture, whether it's baseball or Hollywood, is, is built on both a combination of truth and myth. And the military has been held as an example of of being you know in sort of at the vanguard of equality so long before companies like shell oil or ibm had men of color in the upper ranks the the army did in in particular and and there's always you know people will go back to general charles young or um or or the first you know african-american cadets at west point that the army treated horribly and most of them didn't go on to to full careers but the, and and my, my point, though, in bringing on sort of the, the, the myth of the vanguard is that there's, there's a reality in it, but I think it makes general society still think, well, the military is still paving the way. And, and so that's, that's kind of the, the difficulty. If you approach that to Congress, my sense is often you'll get some people in Congress who will say you're right, and then you'll have some people in Congress who will hearken back to the military being a former um, leader in, in this critical area. That, that's my, my one comment on the difficulties um, in, in making that argument become more of a cemented reality. Because I, I agree with the second proposition that just as we look at jury service differently today than we did during Batson versus Kentucky, right? I mean, because at Batson versus Kentucky, you know, the, the goal was... Um, to have uh, a race neutral jury selection. Today, you look at states like Washington and New Mexico and California, and there's a view that 
you really have to have a diverse um, you have to have a diverse jury at the end because people will have a broader and more open and respectful discussion and understanding of each other and decisional processes. So I, it, it's not, you know, you'll hear comments like, well, that's window dressing. People are fair. I, I think people look at mentors and role models and the capability or me possibility that a mentor or role model is someone other than their own color of their skin or their own gender. And by having a an array of very talented people without glass ceilings who rise to the top would serve so many purposes, um, but some of which we've talked about and some other purposes and just uh, boosting public confidence in the military, you know, in the long term and making the military look top to bottom like the country as a whole demographically, um, that's all important. But I also think it would have a significant effect on making the military justice system, however it evolves, to, to be more of a, a fair system in terms of bringing people um, who are suspected of committing offenses on an equal, a more equal footing and getting into court martials. I mean, that, that's, my, that's my sense, because it's still a problem when you have um, the, the court martial rates, um, the, the acquittal rates may be the same, and I'll say fine, but the court martial rates being disproportionately disfavorable to young men of color. And, and I think that having higher ranking uh, at the very top and having it more diverse will, will certainly be a help to that. Thank you very much. Um, that's a long-winded last... answer. I'm sorry. No, that was good. That, and that's what that's that's what I mean. It's like we you can't. There's no blanket answer for anything. It's all relative and depends. Um, Jessica Burrell, I'm going to hold your question because next week, June the eighth, we're talking about disparity of uh, uh, the military justice um, UCMJ um, re relative to diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. So if you could. Tune back in June the 8th at one o'clock. We will have another panel that's talking about military justice. Um, one last question for Commander DeGroot. You talked about your experiences from 2005-ish. Um, are we headed in the right direction? So um, I think we are only because we're talking about it. Some of these other uh, even the, um, I believe, uh, Carrie talked about the Military Leadership Diversity Commission. I'll be honest, as a young lieutenant, I had no idea that was going on. I had no idea these things were happening. But our lieutenants know, because it's being talked about, uh, that our senior leaders are engaging in inclusion and diversity discussions, that we are being transparent about it and that on all, all levels are involved in uh, the culture of excellence in the Navy and, in, um, and we're a part of Task Force One Navy. So I think we are moving in the right direction. The key is to make it not a flash in the pan to when the next new thing comes along, we forget about DEI, that it is a ongoing continual process and requires training from leaders and leaders to be trained consistently from the time they, they are ensigns or E1s coming in, our role in, in, in creating and fostering uh, an inclusive, diverse, and equitable uh, culture within our, our armed services. So I think, yes, we are headed in the right direction. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you to all of my panel. It's impossible for us to give you all that, you, that we could give you on this topic, but we wanted to educate you a little bit more about the things that are going on. One of the, I think it was the Navy um, CO said, silence is not an option. Silence is an option if you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so we want to help you make sure you're talking about the same thing, the things that will make a difference, the things that's going to change future generations, that they don't have to deal with what we've been dealing with. They don't have to deal with someone calling them boy and not understanding why that's not appropriate or any other um, def defamatory word. So again, thank you to my panel. Thank you to the, to the uh, audience that has uh, participated. Come back with us next week, June the 8th at one o'clock. We will have part two of this panel speaking specifically to um, diverse disparity of military justice cases.